Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for today's second session and the third session of WBEX 2013. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the two sessions so far. Um, we're going to be changing gear now, going up the ante um, with Pamela McLean, talking about um, self as coach and building capacity as a coach. Uh, this is an eagerly anticipated session. In fact, I believe it's one of the most registered for sessions so far, I think, from uh, from what I've seen. And that's not from the three. That's from all of the sessions so far. So it's got quite a huge number of coaches registered for it. Anyhow, um, what Pam, speaking with Pam just before we started, um, we were discussing about interactivity and how um, the sessions were can go on if they're not broken down. So what we'd love to do is to have you involved in the session. So we're going to have a series of polls, so you need to be paying attention and please be contributing. Also, on the question box on the right-hand side um, of your control panel, please take the time to ask the questions. If you need clarity on anything at all, please ask it on the right-hand side. If you've got any opinions, views, anything whatsoever, but particularly if you've got some questions that would answer um, some, of the, 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 some of the answers that you need yourself, and also feel free to ask on behalf of the group as well if you feel that there's some clarity needed. Um, we are, after all, a learning group and um, we're here to support each other. Um, on that note, um, we are creating our community as always, facebook.com forward slash WBECS. If you're in the Twitter sphere, please feel free um, to tweet. Um, it is the hashtag WBECS. Those of you that I've had a lot of questions relating to this. Um, how do we get our ICF, CCEU credits? Don't worry. You don't even need to do anything. All you need to do is just make a note of all the sessions you're attending. And at the end of WBEX 2013, we'll send you a simple form. You just check some boxes, send it back to us. We verify. We give you the certificates. And it's as easy as pie like that. It takes about three minutes. So don't worry. You don't need a form for every session. Um, we've got a special arrangement around that, which saves you loads of time. And it's cool. Um, now. Um, if you have any questions, I say, please put them in the chat box on the right side. But I would like to introduce to you Pamela McLean. Uh, Pamela is a preeminent coach and author of the completely revised handbook of coaching, which I know a huge number of you have read. Um, it's a, it, Pamela is a, a preeminent authority on coaching, transformational learning, transition, and change in the adult journey. Um, she's a PhD and has at been at the forefront of the field of adult development and the emerging field of coaching for the past 30 years. Um, as CEO and co-founder of the Hudson, Hudson, I should say, Institute of Coaching, Pam oversees one of the premier coaching programs and adult learning organizations, which is committed to excellence in developing highly skilled coaches with a focus on coaching theory, current research, and best practices. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to my good friend, Pamela McLean. Over to you, Pam. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that great introduction. And I'm delighted to be part of WeBec 213, and especially uh, to be here with all of you on the uh, first day of these longer sessions. So uh, thank you. And as Ben said, uh, greetings to all of you. I'm really hoping we can have an interactive session today. And just a little bit about myself, I do head up the Hudson Institute of Coaching. And we are one of the pioneers in the field of coaching, having been uh, in this arena for almost 30 years now. And just last year, I completed a major revision of one of the very earliest books in coaching, now retitled the Completely Revised Handbook of Coaching. So at Hudson, we train seasoned professional leaders who want to become coaches. We work inside organizations with people who are wanting to develop coaching uh, um, uh, skills. And at Hudson, we work every day to make our world a better place by engaging in some make a difference work. So I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, uh, I was thinking earlier today in preparation for, for uh, my time with you that 
it may be particularly fitting that I am talking with you on the kickoff day because the the uh, focus of this session is really about looking at what the key ingredients are that make us masterful. And, and this is what the baseline is all about. So we can talk about lots of specialties and we can talk about how to build great businesses, but if we don't have our baseline, our coaching ingredients uh, that, that allow us to be at our very best as coaches, then all of the rest of it becomes uh, a kind of secondary. So, so our focus at Hudson and certainly the focus in the completely revised handbook has been in articulating and understanding what are the essential elements for mastery as, as we uh, develop uh, in our in our own coaching and and uh, I know that um, Probably uh, all of you on this call have plenty of familiarity with the skill-based competencies that are articulated, have been articulated and, and carefully studied by ICF, EMCC, and others. Skills like listening, asking good questions, building awareness, getting goals, uh, helping our clients uh, uh, progress along the pathway. Uh, and, and these are important but they're not enough. And so what we believe is that there are several key ingredients that extend well beyond the skill-based competencies. And, and one of the first places that we can go is on the other side of that slide, you see that long list of knowledge-based competencies. So both skill and knowledge base are key for us. And what's very interesting and advantageous in the field of coaching is at the time that we emerge as this field of study, there are so many fields that have come before us, and it allows us in the field of coaching to essentially utilize and sit on the shoulders of, of many other areas of study and inform our good work. So you might have some that, that you would add to that list, but at least for now, that's a hefty list of knowledge that, that we can um, rely on and, and call upon. So those are two key ingredients, and, uh, and then when we look at this next slide, we see several other elements that we consider key ingredients in, in coaching. One uh, under the client uh, is the whole person model. We need to understand the context of, that our client lives in. That, that block at the bottom methodology, we must have an underlying process of the unfolding engagement in order to do good work. And right above that, you see the working alliance and then the self as coach. So let's take a brief look at, at uh, each of these key ingredients before we move uh, into specifically looking at self as coach. So the whole person, what do we mean by this? A holistic view of our client provides us with a sense of the context of our client. No client is just a problem or an issue, but all of our clients are embedded in layers of context. And so as you look at this wheel, you might think of each of the layers of this circle as being a lens, just one of many lenses and understanding the context of our client. And we could start at the beginning, the, the center of that circle, and, and you see the go for it, doldrums, cocooning, getting ready, the, this ever, never ending cycle of transition and change that every one of us as human beings is engaged in. And, and this natural uh, desire, of course, for most of us to be in that go-for-it place when everything is working on all cylinders and we're feeling great. But there are plenty of times for our clients and, and for all of us on this call when we enter the doldrums, that, the, those times when we're out of sync, and, and what's important for us as coach is to notice, is my client coming to me at a time of big change? Or is this a time of relative stability in their life? Is my client arriving feeling mostly good about life or largely upside down and out of sync? This helps inform how we're going to approach our work with the client and it gives us a layer of context. 
And you see that next circle is really about the values and sense of purpose. Uh, what matters most to me at this time in my life? This is our fuel. This is what drives our dreams. And so it's key for us as coach <clears throat> to explore this with our client, to understand what it is that matters at this time that is most important. In that third ring, we see the roles and systems at play at any point in a client's life, the context of her life at this moment in time. It's things like, you know, is this the early part of my client's life journey when she's busy climbing the ladder, she's building skills, maybe creating a family, uh, inevitably feeling stretched in all ways? Or on the other hand, is she nearing the end of her career, the family is shrinking? And so the roles and systems shrink and expand often in relation to the stages in the life cycle. So understanding the developmental pathway, that, that next uh, outer circle that says first launch, second launch, third launch, is key for us. It's, impor it's important for us to know um, that the values and sense of purpose that fuels our 32-year-old client are quite different in all likelihood than what fuels a 58-year-old. And it's important for us to know that there are likely some very predictable turning points in this adult journey that create powerful reflective times for us and for our clients. So knowing that the beginning of our career holds certain, certain challenges, uh, that that uh, moving into a marriage or a commitment to a life partner or moving to a whole new part of the globe or starting a family or getting fired or getting a big promotion or leaving a marriage or leaving a career, all of these transitions are essential for us coaches to understand and recognize in our clients. It helps us to build empathy, uh, to walk in the shoes of another, and we will notice later on that that's really key for, for uh, our, our working alliance with the client. Uh, and it reminds us always, no client is an issue. All clients have a context that, that we need to understand. So that's just one ingredient. Uh, another ingredient uh, that we have put a lot of effort into researching and understanding is methodology. This allows us to move as coach reliably from the beginning to the end of every engagement and to be able to sit with five or six client cases and say, here's the process that I walked through. I could map each one of these cases to a reliable underlying process, one that allows us to move from the very early contract to creating aspirational goals, uncovering the natural obstacles and resistance that happens every time we want to make a change working those coaching goals, uh, using our stakeholders on behalf of our client, and ultimately getting to the finish line. One of the things that, that I certainly have observed in, in many years of, of working with coaches is that in our early stages of coaching, it is tempting, uh, um, almost irresistible, to move from getting, identifying what you believe is the issue to putting together a plan. And, and of course, it is uh, um, uh, so critical that we understand as coaches how change happens. And, and that change does not happen when we get out ahead and tell our client what to do. Uh, that sharing even the best of our ideas and experiences will never result in sustainable change. And so while this methodology or any methodology that you might be familiar with may look kind of linear, it's really not meant to be a dogma at all, but rather to be a great agile scaffolding and support for us as coaches. So that's another key ingredient. And then going back uh, to the uh, slide that we started with, that working alliance, we know that without a working alliance, no good coaching exists. And what's very interesting for us, and this kind of goes back to the knowledge-based competencies, is there has been a great deal of research in the field, particularly in the field of psychology, uh, around what is it that makes for a very successful uh, um, 
uh, engagement with a psychologist. And one of the things that has been proven over and over again is that it doesn't really matter if you go see a behaviorist or someone with a Jungian orientation or a humanist or a Freudian. What makes the big difference, given they have some orientation, let's just remember that, there's some methodology at play, what makes the biggest difference is the working alliance. So this, this is very helpful for us to remember as coaches, that as long as we have a methodology, that becomes background, and the working alliance really is foreground for us. And what does that translate into? It, it is the coach's experience of us being empathic, supportive, present, working hand-in-hand hand, uh, toward the, the uh, goals that are important, and and what is uh, really, I think, helpful for us to remember is that the quality of our working alliance is almost entirely dependent on our mastery of self. And so that brings us to uh, our work today, the self, self as coach, as, as um, our home base. And... and um, before we talk about each of those dimensions, I want to just take us to uh, a little bit of a review of some work of Karen Horney, an adaptation of some work of Karen Horney. Many years ago, she developed a, uh, a essentially what I think of as a three-legged stool, you know, that we have to have these three uh, uh, strategies in order to do well. And so I did an adaptation of these in my book and said that, you know, as a coach, at the highest level, we have to have agility on this stool to be able to operate in all three of these domains. And, and I'm, I'm going to just walk through them uh, kind of quickly, but we're going to take a poll once I've walked through them. So pay attention and, and do some reflecting on where your comfort zone is and, and where the areas are that you might choose to uh, put some attention if you were going to develop more capacity. Moving toward connecting and caring, it turns out that for most of us as coaches, that's the easy one. We, we know from research that people who enter work like coaching and many other prof helping professions, we tend to be drawn to this work because we are naturally nurturing. Uh, we're pretty good at making strong uh, connections, uh, being compassionate and helping others. So building that working alliance, moving toward, comes quite easily for most of us. The second one, moving against, where our work is about challenging the client, observing things, sharing our observations, moving against, tends to be more challenging for most of us as coaches. This is our ability to share key, key observations even when they're uncomfortable. It's our ability to challenge the client's thinking even when the client is, is quite attached to their thinking and to notice patterns that may be a little uneasy for us to bring up and move against. Uh, so this is probably the area in, in my experience over the years that most of us need to uh, put some focus. Uh, and then thirdly, we have that moving away, that, that ability to step back, to, to be discerning about when to step back, when to sit in silence, and, and how to manage our temptation, especially early on, that, that is to fill the gaps in the conversation, when there's silence, to, to fill it in in order to ease our own anxiety and when instead to allow the silence to do the heavy lifting that might create space for reflection and, and insight for the client. So uh, let, let's just stop here for a minute and, and take a poll and see uh, as I've walked through each of these, uh, which one would be the area that you think uh, would be useful for you to spend, uh, uh, to put a spotlight on if you were going to develop more capacity. So take a moment to take that poll and let's see, Ben, what we find out from that poll. Okay, the, the poll has been launched. I'm just going to give everyone 30 seconds to fill out. A couple We've got... of minutes. Yeah, may, we got a, we've already got 50% have voted. We're up. Perfect. 60% have voted. Wow, very attentive audience. That's great. Almost up to 70% now. Can we give you maybe another 20 seconds? Sure. 
Pam, you have to you have to let me know if you can see the results because sometimes it, for some reason I it can't. doesn't. Yeah, for some reason it doesn't let the presenters see them. But uh, I will give you the results when um, once once the poll close the poll in about ten seconds time. Uh, okay, great. You've got eighty eighty percent. Okay, cool. I'm gonna close the poll off now. Thank you very much for everyone for doing that. Okay, so, so what do we see, Ben? What we have is um, with twelve percent, we have moving toward. Um, connecting and caring. Uh, we then have 39% we have moving against um, and that's challenging and sharing observations and then finally we have 49% almost half of the audience said moving away silence and detachment. Oh interesting that is great. You know, it doesn't always show up that way. So, so this is great. That forty-nine percent moving away uh, uh, will will come back to that. But uh, sometimes that is about the ability to be comfortable with myself being silent. Uh, and and you know, the the experience that that I see repeatedly is that as coaches. Uh, we imagine our clients are thinking as quickly as we are. But it's seldom the case because our client is processing uh, some things that are really key to their own uh, um, interests. And that takes us much longer. Uh, so that silence is such a critical one for us to be able to be discerning about. So so that's great. Uh, and moving against uh, um, that ability to share observations it looks like a whole lot of people on this call have comfort there so fantastic well so we'll continue and we'll come back to some of these and you'll see these show up in the in the self as coach uh, but at Hudson what we say is that that we need to start at home and this is where our home base is this is where our internal landscape is and and so often people uh, will will come to us and and want to have the tools. Show us the tool. What are the tools that we need to be great coaches? And I always say, you know what? We have to start at home. Our most important tool is ourself. And cultivating our uh, most versatile tool allows us to bring um, our whole cultivated, managed self to the coaching. And this is not easy work for us because it requires that we take a pretty close look at not just our strengths, but, but our weaknesses, the blind spots that we inevitably have, our defaults. So, you know, under stress, sometimes even the smallest stress, we will go to default mode uh, even while we have a goal of showing up differently. And all of these tendencies are, are uh, at play, and, and we are asked to take a look at all of these as we develop the inner landscape that allows us to utilize any of these dimensions uh, uh, at will when we're working with our clients. So this is a, a key professional development area for us. And I want you to just consider a few scenarios for a moment. Uh, I'm going to take us on a very quick walk around this wheel, and, and we'll go into each of these in more depth. But just follow along and, and see uh, what would be top of your list if you were choosing just one of these in your own capacity building. And we will have time to take a little bit of a poll in a minute. So let's start at the top presence, the use of self with intention. So this is our ability to use myself with intention. Uh, what if, as a coach, you rush into your coaching session focused on some personal issue that's just happened for you, unable to let go of it and really get focused on your client? How does that impact your presence? Empathic stance, the use of self and one's capacity to walk in the shoes of another. So that shift from making judgments to being curious, that ability to walk in the shoes of another, imagine how an experience might be for our client. So what if your urge to action, if you're one of those people that really likes to move to action, what if that, that urge leaves you almost taking on the client's issue 
and, and gives the client a sense that they haven't been fully understood by you. Range of feelings, your ease in exploring a full scope of emotions. What if your overly positive perspective, we've all met people like this, right? Overly positive perspective overlooks the client's feelings of dark, darker concerns and doubts. Boundary awareness. So this is a complex one, managing what belongs to the client, the client system, the client story, and what your work as coach is. What if you find the client's dilemma so upsetting that you want to jump in and rescue your client? Kind of moving across that invisible boundary and all of a sudden you're in their garden instead of in your own. Somatic awareness. Every action, they tell us, originates in the body. So what's your awareness of your somatic presence? What if the force of your voice, the pace of your words, are so overpowering that a client is reluctant to share her real anxieties and concerns? Somatic awareness. And then finally, courage to challenge, that skill of sharing observations. What if you don't want to offend or upset? What if you want the client to like you? Or what if you've been taught to be polite and you choose not to challenge your client around key issues because you default to that old behavior of being polite or, or looking to be liked? So these are just a handful of the dynamics that highlight uh, some of what will show up in each of these elements of our internal landscape, the self as coach, that either promote or undermine our client's ability to achieve the changes that are important to them. So let's step back for a moment and take a quick poll. Uh, what is your number one area of capacity building in these six domains? If you were to focus on just one area to strengthen, which would make the greatest difference in your own work as a coach right now? Take a minute to do that. Once again, I can't see what's showing up, so maybe you'll tell me, Ben. I'm um, sorry. What what we've got on the screen is just the the poll, and everyone's will be checking on their screen to vote. We have about fifty percent already, up to sixty percent, coming up to seventy percent. Very fast. It's not normally this fast. You, have, <laughs> you don't normally have that many people engaged. Good on you, coaches, for being engaged. Already over eighty percent. That's incredible. Okay, cool. I'm going to, where I need, maybe another 20 seconds, not even that, 15 seconds. And I will close it off. Okay, thank you very much. You've got three seconds left to vote. Three, two, one, and we'll close the poll. And I'm going to share the results. Okay, so we have, um, for range of feelings, um, we have 12%. Um, for empathic stance, we have 3%. Ben, you, ben, ben, I didn't hear it. You have 12% for range of feelings. Mm -hmm. And then we have empathic stance, we have 3%. Hmm. We then have boundary awareness, 21%. Yep. Somatic awareness, 31%. And courage hmm. to challenge, all the way at 32%, the leader. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. That's great. So, you know, the empathic stance of being the lowest really connects with the research on people who are drawn to this kind of work, are naturally good at connecting, at moving toward, and that really fits with the empathic stance, too, as well as, to some degree, the range of feelings. So, uh, so that, that's great. We're going to um, take a, a deeper dive right now into each of these six elements. And, and what I'm going to do is in the next uh, portion, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, digging into each of these domains a bit. We'll look at a brief coaching situation, and then we'll take a look at what you might do to build more capacity, knowing that this isn't a one-stop, but that we're always capacity building in these areas. And then uh, you'll be able to download uh, a worksheet 
uh, after this session that highlights this whole process and gives you a chance to uh, to kind of tinker with what might be a, a, um, a 2013 development plan for you in, in this domain. So let's get started. Uh, we, we begin uh, with presence and uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, and and so presence is our ability to be completely in the moment and flexible enough to handle the unexpected. Now, how's that for challenging? And you know, I think that most of us under underrate how challenging it is for us to be present, uh, that in fact it requires not just skill, but, but it requires a lot of regular attention uh, to build and maintain presence. It is not a, um, there's not an end point here. And I'm sure everyone in this call has experiences of times when you feel like you are really honing your presence and other times when uh, you uh, walk through periods of great distraction. So, you know, one of the things that we learn uh, from the field of mindfulness is the power of uh, mindfulness practice. I, I have come to believe that it, it is likely essential that great Great coaches uh, are invested in a mindfulness practice and, and really use that mindfulness practice to to cultivate presence. Um, so, how you manage and notice your presence and your availability is everything. Uh, I wonder if you just reflect on the past uh, week or two and, and you might have uh, uh, come to your mind an experience or two when you've been in a conversation that matters to you a whole lot and the other person goes away, is not fully present, and how that feels for you on the receiving end. And, and so for us to know what derails us in relation to our own presence, what does it require for me to quickly return to a centered place? This is our work as coach in every moment of our coaching session, to be fully present rather than worrying about what happened a few minutes ago, what we need to do next. You remember early on in coaching when what you were worried about is what was the right question that I should be asking next, uh, or very early on in coaching when you were worried about maybe there's a solution that I could come up with for my client's problem. But one of the things that I find quite uh, exciting in the field of coaching is is some of the work uh, folks like Boyatzis have been doing in the EQ domain where uh, um, they are able to see that when we are present, fully present with our clients, our client, there is this attunement factor that, that begins to happen. And, and so, in fact, what research shows is that when we are fully present in our coaching, the coach finds the, uh, the exchange every bit as beneficial as the client does. And so you might think about some of your coaching and notice, when am I in that attunement? When do I walk away from a coaching engagement feeling really fully um, enlivened by it? And on the other hand, when do I feel drained? And, and to examine what that, that drained feeling is about and what my role might be in that. So, I want you to consider uh, a situation uh, uh, relative to presence. Th this came up in my Webeck preview session a few weeks ago when we were doing questions and we were talking a bit about presence and one of the participants asked a question really relevant to this and said, quote, what do I do to manage my presence when I have back-to-back -back coaching sessions, unquote. So very interesting question here and, and one that, that not just addresses presence, but it, it also addresses the ethical domain. Am I ethically able to provide great coaching if I'm working in back-to-back -back sessions where I have allocated no time to catch my breath, to take notes, to prep for the next session and recenter myself? What do I notice about myself when I'm rushing into another coaching session? How does this likely impact my work within this engagement? 
But I think, you know, in addition to this, we're talking about uh, as well the cultures that many of us are living in where uh, it has become uh, commonplace. We think that it's normal to run from one thing to another thing to another thing, and, and we believe that, that we are productive as long as we're going at the speed of light. But, but it turns out that is uh, often not the case and certainly not the case when we need to be present in our work with our client. So doing our work, what is it that we can do as coach to cultivate our presence? Uh, and and this, uh, that visual there is uh, just a snapshot of the worksheets that you'll be able to download. You know, I think there's a lot that we can do here, and I think there's a lot we need to be doing here. And, and so some of those are preserving time before our coaching session. I really believe that it's critical for us to take time to review themes from our notes, to reflect on the big picture of the coaching, what's happened thus far, to take time to pay attention to what's most required of me in this engagement. So if this is a client that, that is meandering all over the map, then what's required of me is to get some focus. If this is a client who is continually deflecting feedback, my what's demanded of me, needed of me, is to hold them accountable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think that we ought to uh, all have a practice of taking five or ten minutes to get centered and present, and to choose a sen to choose a setting that promotes your presence. Uh, so I. I I will uh, um, often engage in supervision with coaches, and I can be listening to a tape of someone uh, who is coaching someone, and uh, excuse me, could you pass me the salt, please? Uh, oh, yeah, I would like a little bit more butter. And we're coaching over a lunch table in a restaurant with noise all around us and the salt and pepper coming and going, and it is next to impossible for us to get present and remain present when we uh, put ourselves in, maybe sometimes agree to, a setting that is not conducive to great coaching. Um, and I think, you know, the, the default that we really have to work against when we are coaching over the phone in the quiet of our own office is to make sure that the laptop cover is down and that we are fully focused on our client and not things that are incoming. Uh, so remaining present through the session, uh, uh, another one. I, you know, I think what's important is for us to know that thoughts come and go, that we all are, can be sitting and coaching and a thought about something tomorrow will come. But as long as we have an awareness of that, we can let it come and, and let it go and come back to center. And then that third one, creating a reflective space after each session, again, I think a really important ethical practice for us. Uh, so uh, next one is uh, the empathic stance. Our ability to walk in the shoes of another and understand what a given situation might feel like from their perspective defines empathy. And empathy doesn't take a lot of words, but it does convey to our client, I see you, I get you. Uh, and, and this is key in building trust and, and in building an environment where our client is willing to share what's really most important. Um, so, so this empathy factor is key in uh, allowing our client to feel safe enough to uh, uh, uncover for themselves, not just for us, but for themselves, what is really critical in this coaching. So, so consider this uh, coaching situation. Let's say a client shares being at a difficult crossroads in life, leaving a, a 35-year career. Uh, they planned it. They were looking forward to it. Uh, they had their first big trip with their spouse planned. And, uh, um, and all of a sudden, as the date gets closer, uh, there is this sadness that, uh, that starts to show up. And as the client uh, tells you about this, the client even becomes a little choked up and a little tearful in the moment. 
but the coach moves straight to action and says, ah, so this is a big, exciting time for you. What's ahead? And misses that critical opportunity to notice this powerful moment in the client's life and how much feeling is unleashed around this transition even when it's planned. So, so our ability to imagine what it's like to walk in the shoes of another cannot be understated for us as coach. What, what can our work be about to cultivate this? You know, I'm sure many of you uh, are aware of some of the work around uh, shifting from the judging mindset to the curious mindset. I do think that being curious helps us walk in someone else's shoes. I don't think that as coaches we have to have every experience that every client has in order to be empathic, but to practice seeing something from someone else's perspective without all of my beliefs and biases and judgments impacting me, that is a practice that I think we really have to consciously cultivate as coaches. So the next one is range of feelings. This is the one that in the poll many of you talked about, I think. Let me just go back here. So no, range of feelings is 12%. So sorry about that. So we're good on this one, range of feelings. And, and that's not surprising, really. We're drawn to this work. And so, so um, many of you have cultivated a, a great range of feelings. But I will tell you, that that uh, for for coaches who have some feelings that are out of bounds, I have not explored and and for whatever reasons in my own life these have not been comfortable areas for me. That means that that is likely out of bounds in our coaching as well. And so uh, it's not uncommon, frankly, to hear people talk about uh, crying making them uncomfortable when a uh, client uh, comes to me and, and starts getting tearful, I want to move it on. Uh, and, and the reality is, and, and the way change happens, is it, change is not a thinking process. We have to have a combination of thinking and feeling at play in order to cultivate change. And, and so when feelings show up in coaching, it's a missed opportunity if we can't use those. Hence, the need for us, each of us as coaches, to have a, a wide range accessible for ourselves and, and uh, good comfort in, in those. Um, so let, let's um, just, uh, I'm not going to take this poll, Ben, because this group already said that only 12% of them are, are challenged in this area. So I think instead of taking a poll here, perhaps we just take a, a, a step back and, and see if, uh, if we're stirring any questions or if there's anything that you're wishing that I would be saying a little bit more about before I continue around that wheel. Any, okay. any comments that we can grab, Ben? Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a question for you, Pam. Um, on the question of presence, um, what is your view on making notes in a coaching session? Great question. I am really firmly uh, um, in favor of waiting until after the session. I think that it gets in the way of our presence. And I think the other thing is that, especially early on, uh, early coaches will have a sense that they need to write it all down. And in fact, we don't. What we need to remember is what are the themes? What are the patterns? And, and if we are fully present in the session, we can easily write those down at the end of the session. There's literally been some great work done on what, what happens if uh, at the end of a session you write down verbatim everything you can remember. And generally speaking, at about page two and a half, that's the, that's the extent of what we, uh, we can recall. But when we look through what we've recalled, we have been able to grab the essential themes that are going to continue to get pulled through the coaching. So great question about about uh, taking notes. Thank you. Any others, Ben, that are showing up? Yes. Um, how do you work on not rescuing your client? 
How do you work on not rescuing your client? It's really, you know, this is uh, in large part boundary awareness. You know, I think that first of all, we have to continually remind ourselves that our work is not in fixing a client's problems that our work first is in helping a client frame what they want to shift and change in an aspirational way, but then it is to help a client see themselves and to see what gets in the way, what their obstacles are. And, and uh, to rescue is uh, to fall short of our work because if I rescue you, you'll come back for another rescue, but you won't create sustainable change, right? Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that when we talk about boundaries because it really becomes uh, uh, such interesting and complex territory. Uh, maybe one last one, Ben, before we go on. Okay, um, I've got quite a few. Um, here we go. Um, in, in, regarding feelings, um, would you be able to give another example of where a coach might not be able to help a client with a feeling they themselves can't handle? So if I can't handle the confrontation, what is my default yeah. with the client? Right. I think this is, the, this is a great one. So I think the most common ones are if I'm uncomfortable with tears, that becomes uh, challenging. And, and the other one is around anger. Uh, if anger is not a, an area that I'm comfortable with and I've got a client who's pretty darn angry, I'm going to work hard to shut down those conversations just naturally as coach because this is not in my comfort zone. And I'm not going to be able to, what I think of as contain what the, the feelings of the client in an effort to facilitate the changes they need to make. So I, I do think those are the two most common areas that, that we need to build capacity in. If conflict is not your um, area of strength, if you shy away from conflict, uh, if anger makes you uncomfortable, that's a good cue that this is an area of development, uh, uh, that this is an area of capacity building that will really strengthen your uh, ability as a coach. So let, let's just uh, keep going now, and we can come back to a bit of that, but time is moving along, and we're now at boundary awareness where we can talk squarely about some of these really challenging situations. And um, uh, uh, boundary awareness has many layers to it. it when, and when we engage with co in coaching, we immediately sense this you know, that we're operating, we're walking into several different systems. There's, there's our system that we create between client and coach. Um, there are multiple boundaries that, that we are managing. There's the professional boundary. Uh, so, you know, with the early on coach, you'll often hear people say, can I, um, is it okay if I become a friend of my client. Uh, so, so that professional boundary, this is a professional relationship. It's not a pro potential friend or a potential business partner. There's the confidentiality boundaries. It, it, the minute we walk in, especially into coaching leaders and organizations, we bump up against these. And if I'm hired uh, by HR to coach a leader, what are my boundaries? You know, what, what do I say when the HR person wants some information? What, what, what can I guarantee my client? There's the, the boundary, the power of uh, triangulation in, in coaching, which is very much in the boundary domain. So, you know, here's a common one that probably many of you uh, have been uh, found yourself in. The boss calls you. Uh, hoping you'll pass along feedback to his direct report, your client, and, and uh, uh, actually expects you to pass along that information to your client. And, and of course, the minute you do, you cross the boundary and you become less effective as a client. You really enter that system. Um, so let, let me just uh, uh, put on the table a couple of coaching situations, uh, uh, knowing that this is a particularly uh, of interest to many of you. So let's say that I am an external executive coach in, call it company XYZ, and I've coached several people in XYZ. I've got a good sense of the culture, the politics, and key players, 
And I've now been assigned a leader who reports to uh, the CFO. And this is the second member of his team that I've coached. So I have a pretty good relationship with him. And lo and behold, I get a call from him and he says to me, boy, am I glad you are coaching John. He's been a pain in the you-know-what, quote-unquote. And I probably, just between us, haven't been frank enough with him about how bad things are. So I wonder if you could give him some tough, a tough love message and, and help me out here. I'm sure there are lots of people in one way or another who have found themselves in, in this place. And, and so this is when we have boundary awareness, uh, we can step back and make sure that we are maintaining our boundaries and, and helping this CFO have the conversation he needs to have with his direct report, sometimes with us present, uh, but, but that we don't put ourselves at risk of being the go-between and entering that, that system. Uh, so how do we work this territory of boundary awareness? I think first and foremost, we have to work it all of the time. And one of the things that, that I find very helpful uh, and usable in any setting we are in is to pay attention to triangles because whenever we are engaged in a triangle we we are um, uh, at risk around boundaries so <laughs> there is um, some work that was done many years ago by a, a fellow by the name of Murray Bowen who's done a lot of work on uh, systems thinking and he used to work with med students uh, uh, and he would send them home over the holidays and say here's your assignment I want you to notice how many times in the next 10 days you are talking to one member of your family about a third member of your family and that's triangulation uh, and, and of course, what we notice is that we're often talking to a third member because it creates tension for us to have a direct conversation with the actual person. So we're back to the CFO who wants to triangulate with the coach because he doesn't want to um, have that uncomfortable and important conversation with his own direct report. So we can learn a lot about ourselves as coaches by just paying attention even for 10 days, 7 to 10 days, write it down, log it twice a day. How many times am I engaged in a triangle? Um, I think another one is to notice which boundaries in coaching are most challenging. Uh, certainly that confidentiality boundary, uh, we can be challenged mightily in inside organizations around this and, and uh, there may be certain situations where you feel even more challenged. Uh, uh, so noticing that on a regular basis, talking, talking with a peer coach, a supervisor about that immensely helpful. Uh, and then this last one, monitoring how frequently you're drawn into your client's story really goes back, Ben, to the question that you put forward around what do I do not to uh, rescue my client. I think that when we rescue, we, we can be assured that we have been drawn into their story. Uh, and, and instead of helping them see their story, we cross the line and we now move into their story. Uh, so monitoring how often I'm drawn in literally helps us stay on the other side of, of that, that line. Uh, so the, the uh, final, final area is the somatic awareness for us. This is a lot of fun uh, uh, to explore as coaches and of course not nearly as easy to do over the phone as it is when we're in person, but, but every action originates in our body. And so the question is what do we know about how we show up? And, and there really is um, uh, only, uh, there are only a handful of ways that we can learn about how we show up and one of them, the most powerful perhaps, is asking people who are willing to give us honest feedback about how we show up. And a series of uh, somatic features that can really impede our work as coaches. And I mentioned one earlier, the, the somatic element of the, the pace at which I move, the volume of my voice, e even um, 
uh, more, it's not uncommon in my experience to watch a coach with a furrowed brow and a serious look on the face as though we're talking about life itself, you know, coming to an end, and no matter what the client says. Uh, that that furrowed brow uh, remains in place throughout the entire session. And of course that, that changes, that impacts our client. And for the most part, I think this is hard information for us to get a hold of. Uh, so, so whatever you might uh, uh, do to find out what, what don't I see about myself? Uh, uh, who, is, who is going to be willing to give me some feedback about my somatic self? Uh, that is going to be useful for, for us. Uh, so on this, uh, what can we do? Uh, simple things that I've just said, you know, seek feedback. Uh, watch yourself on video. There is nothing more powerful than seeing yourself on video. It cured me of a somatic uh, feature that I had uh, uh, like nothing else has. So if you haven't had the opportunity to see yourself over a period of time on video, it's definitely a great way to get some information. The last one is the one that you all came uh, out with the highest score on the Courage to Challenge, and I think you are in very good company here. I think that uh, sharing our observations, providing feedback even when it's uncomfortable, this is uh, paramount in our coaching, and this is an area that I think um, we all need to continually work at. This is what our clients come to us for, to, uh, to uh, be able to get feedback that they can't get anywhere else, uh, to uh, experience our transparency in this way, and, and uh, to uh, trust that we aren't going to be um, sugarcoating things because of our own discomfort. So this is the all-important muscle of moving against, uh, and it, it, does, it truly makes the difference between an okay coach and a real master. Uh, Let's just remember that our clients are not coming to us looking for a friendly chat or an agreeable shoulder. They want to make a change. And, and our clients come to us because they want to make changes that they have not been able to attain on their own. That's why they're here. And, and it is inevitable that our ability to challenge at the right time, our strength to share observations even when it's uncomfortable is essential. And, and what we have have to work against is uh, that tendency to want to play it nice or safe. Um, so, so what does this look like when, when we're coaching? Uh, you know, I think that uh, we could talk about any number of cases, but let's think about a client who wants to be seen uh, as a more reliable member of a team in order to uh, put themselves in a position where they might advance and, and to meet deadlines. And they've had some feedback around this. And this is the area they want to work. And lo and behold, what do you find in coaching? That they come to coaching sessions five or ten minutes late that they're constantly wanting to change coaching sessions. And if you're playing it nice, you're a coach who's saying, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Oh, changing the appointment till, to Friday, no big deal. If you're a coach who can move against and who can challenge and who has the presence to observe, you can use this. And, and notice that the very thing that you're working in coaching is actually happening in coaching. And, and to be able to unpack this in the moment becomes a powerful force for insight and, and change. So what do we do to, uh, to do our work and, and uh, really cultivate this for ourselves? Uh, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, number one, we have to really begin to pay attention to where the opportunities are and, and uh, to notice when we shrink away and, and to begin to log that and talk about that with our uh, peer coaches and, and in supervision. What do we have to do to really strengthen uh, this, this muscle? So here we are uh, right back at the self as coach wheel and and what i hope is that 
in this conversation that we've had today that I've stirred some thinking, that, that um, I've given you a sense that we're all on this journey. And uh, whether you're early in the journey or you view yourself as a master in the journey, we are always in this journey of cultivating our capacity in our internal landscape. And, and hopefully, I've stirred some thinking about an area or two that you might take on as your uh, own area of capacity building going forward. So Ben, I'll turn it back to you for some questions if there are any. Brilliant, Pam. Thank you very much for a super session and some great content. Awesome. So much. Um, I'm just trying to find the questions. I had them all queued up and I've had a bunch of people saying lovely things about you. Um, and I've got to fight my way through that to get to... You'll pass those on, right? Yeah, if, of course. <laughs> okay. um, no, seriously, I'm actually having to fight my way. Here we go. So um, what specifically are way... Or, oh, sorry, let me start again. What specifically are effective ways to challenge clients? I think number one... Well, two, two things that have to be in play. We, we have to be uh, um, partnering with our clients and, and uh, they have to have a sense that we are working with them and they have to experience our respect for them. And when we do that, uh, we are able to challenge in ways that uh, really work for a client. So I can say, if we went back to the client who keeps showing up late, if I don't have that partnering feeling and, and a sense of respect, I might say to my client, you know, this is the third time you've been late. But if I have that sense of partnering and I have a respect for my client, I can step back and say, I want to share an observation with you that I think could be helpful in our work. I actually think the very thing that we're working on is happening right here in our coaching. That, that you uh, often, most often, show up late. And, and, you know, I can think of three times that you wanted to change the time. So could we explore this? And all of a sudden, we have the ability to, in the moment, create immediacy around the very dynamic that is showing up for this person in the rest of their life. So that's at least one example of how we might do that. I think another common way of doing that uh, is is around perspectives. You know, we'll often work with, and probably each of us has this tendency ourselves to think there's one way, and and so when you're working with a client who has one way, to be able to challenge that and say, okay, so you know that's that's one possibility, and maybe it's the right one, but could we play with two or three others? Uh, um, or the client who, uh, um, I, I worked once with a fellow who uh, about eight times in every session would say, um, what was the phrase he had? He, he would say, um, I just have bad luck. That, you know, this just happens to me. I have a lot of bad luck. And after I saw this uh, a few times, and I think we can rely on this, I said to myself, this is a story, right? This is a pattern. And so I, I would say to him, I challenged him and said, you know, I want to share with you how often you say to yourself and to me, I have bad luck. Are you aware of that? He had no idea. He had no idea how many times he said that and the impact that had on him. So I'll stop there with that one. Thank you Other very questions? much. Lovely, yep. lovely answer, Pam. Okay, I've got a, another question for you. Um, to what degree is one's spirituality a valued ingredient in a coaching relationship and what are the benefits or challenges of this dimension well you know I think we go back to boundaries right um, uh, you know we are whole people just like our clients are but my focus is always as a coach on what it is the client wants to change and and brings to that rather than what my perspective my bias or my beliefs might be so I'm always led by my clients agenda 
I think for some, some among us might say that a certain um, sort of spirituality actually is in support of our presence. Uh, but, but relative to coaching, I want to be first and foremost riveted to what my client's agenda is and how I can serve that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm having to mute myself each time because I've got a bit of background noise here. Hopefully you guys aren't being disturbed. Yeah, by. no problem. No problem. Okay. Um, do you suggest to avoid the triangle we were discussing through the contracting and clarifying roles and responsibilities? Well, I think that is really helpful. Uh, and I think the more that we can... Uh, uh, talk about how we work up front, the more we pave the way for clarity around this. Even even challenging, you know, the way you're, you're going to find uh, as we work together that there are going to be times when I'm going to challenge your thinking or I might provide you with uh, some, some feedback or share an observation. So I think anything we can do to normalize. But even then, uh, and particularly, you know, when, when we're doing complex work with leaders inside uh, organizations, even then we are going to run into these challenges. Uh, so, so I think that we can deter some of it and we still have to be uh, aware, vigilant about it. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Sorry, okay. just mute. I keep, I keep mute. <laughs> I keep forgetting I'm muted. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the next question. Okay, so this has come up a few times in, in various sessions, and I'd be interested in your perspective on it. But um, how do we know when we have to stop the coaching because therapy would be a better choice? Mm -hmm. Well, great question. I think that the contracting early on, I, you know, if we went back to, to that methodology, I would say uh, the it's so important for us to take our time when we're contracting. It's really front-loaded, this coaching work is. And, and to make sure we're getting the context of the client. So, you know, remember when I said that whole person perspective. Um, so if very early on in the coaching, I tell you that, that I, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really blue. And and when you ask, you know, so is, is this situational or have you felt this for a long time? And I say, well, actually, I have for years. Uh, uh, we can be discerning early on about this. Um, I think that, that uh, the issue of coaching versus therapy, uh, of course, is always at play for us and that we the work that we can do around great contracting and making sure that we have goals that are within our area of expertise as coaches, uh, that, that we create some boundaries around that, um, that that is enormously helpful. And, and I think that, that early on coaches will, I was just on a call actually last night, a supervision call with, with some early on coaches and, and someone was talking about someone uh, they were working with who they knew had uh, some very traumatic experiences early on in their life and they felt that perhaps they should be asking about these. And, and you know, my response is for what purpose? You know, if, if the work of the coaching, uh, let's say, is around me feeling more confident in my role, right, then let's focus on that. And, and uh, uh, we do not have to go all the way back to the origins of, of um, traumatic experiences in order to help someone make some changes in present day life that are really transformational for them. Now. Having said that, I will also say to you that I think it's also the role of the coach when they see something show up repeatedly that is in the therapeutic domain that we talk about this and that we say, so, you know, I've noticed that we've had uh, five sessions now and, and that each time uh, you are very tearful. 
and I'm so respectful of that, and I get that this is painful, and I begin to think, you know, therapy, there is a time that therapy can be enormously useful, and I wonder if this isn't one of those times. And and if the client you know, wants to talk more about it, I always, as a coach, want to have those resources at my fingertips. Here's someone I would recommend. Here are a couple of names. Um, so, so when it becomes clear that this is out of the coaching domain or that, that psychological issues prevail and make it impossible to coach, then it's incumbent upon us to make referrals and to normalize that. You know, therapy is a good thing uh, for, um, for many situations. It's not the same as coaching and, and um, there's a time and a place for, for both. Thank you so much. Sarah. Other comments or questions? Okay, I think maybe we'll have one last question. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, yep. Okay, Pam, um, what tips do you have um, for when a client does not have answers for an emotional response? So the example is given, they start crying but cannot articulate any reasons or a root cause. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So some uh, some of our clients have more access to their um, emotional terrain than others, uh, and and uh, you know everybody on this call has the experience with some that have little, um, and that's generally harder work for us uh, because now we have to do some exploring and and make some sense out of uh, what's what's happening uh, on the emotional level. But the client who is crying in each session and has no words for it is, is likely not going to um, uh, be able to make uh, the changes uh, that are uh, at play in coaching. I, I would think this is a great uh, signal that perhaps this client might be served better by therapy for a period of time. And, and after that, there may be a good, a good space for coaching. Brilliant. Okie doke, Pam. Thank you so much. There's a lot. There's I'm not going to say a lot. There's hundreds more questions, and I'm sorry that um, everybody didn't have those those who didn't have the questions answered. However, if you jump onto facebookcom forward slash wbecs, you may be lucky and have your question answered on there. Um, um, but yes, we would highly um, encourage you to spend some time um, on the Facebook wall. There's a lot of engagement going on there. We love love to build our community on there. And uh, also, please, I would love to hear your feedback on there from today's session. There's so many wonderful comments on there. So please post them on Facebook wall because the world gets to see how amazing Pam is. Um, and she, mm -hmm. she is amazing. Um, and I really appreciate that. Oh, that would be super. But, um, yeah, Pam, thank you so much for today's session. That was really, really tremendous. You managed to pack in so much into such a, a short time, just an hour. It was brilliant. So thank you so much. Great. Great being with all of you. Yeah, it's, been, bye -bye. it's been a pleasure. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful day, and I will see you for tomorrow's sessions. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.